Adam Block has been in the health economic space for 20 years, starting out working as a consultant for Blue Cross before getting his PhD in health policy economics from Harvard. He then worked for Congress and the Joint Committee of Taxation to find money for the Affordable Care Act, and then was branch director in the Office of Insurance Exchanges for the Affordable Care Act. He then worked for an insurance company, a hospital system, and is now an assistant professor of health policy and management at New York Medical College. While he graduated high school three spots above me, my average was higher, and I beat him by 200 points in the SAT, but that was after they changed the scoring system. Why is any of that important? Well, because he's my brother. So clearly, family get-togethers used to be more fun when there were more headlocks and less discussion of health economics. So today, we discuss the new push for Medicare for All. First, we discuss what Medicare is, what it covers, what it doesn't, and then get into House Bill 1384, the Medicare for All Act of 2019. We discuss why this could be financially problematic for physicians and therefore lead to a physician shortage for patients. Ultimately, we discuss that for political reasons, we really don't need to worry about this on a national level, but it could happen on a state level. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Adam Block, welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. So today we're going to talk about Medicare for all, because that's been in the news quite a bit, especially with the, with the Democratic primary, I guess, kind of looming around the corner. It's a bit of a political buzzword. So I think it's important for doctors to be familiar with what that means, since it impacts us so much. We should know what is Medicare for all. That way, if we feel like contacting our specialty society, the American Medical Association, uh, or even have some questions asked of us at a cocktail party. We have some informed answers, so I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this. So first of all, let's define what is Medicare. So what's Medicare? So Medicare is a program that was signed into law by Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, in 1965 that is designed to cover people over age 65 for basically all of their medical needs. Uh, it recently started including uh, pharmaceutical benefits, and it also covers about 9 million people who are disabled or who have ALS or uh, end-stage renal disease. End-stage renal disease covered by Medicare because of President Nixon, Right. I think I learned that from a John Oliver episode, not exactly the most conservative of ideas coming from a Republican president, but uh, yeah, coverage of end-stage renal disease came from the Nixon administration. Well, it was actually a sort of remarkable political story, uh, what happened, and uh, you sort of see it as an example of health politics in action. And what happened was you had dialysis machines, which were coming out. And these dialysis machines were incredibly effective at keeping people with end-stage renal disease alive. People would die otherwise if they didn't have artificial kidneys. And what happened was they were too expensive for most insurance plans. And so the people were just not getting covered. And so they were slowly dying, even though there was this essentially magical cure, uh, dialysis machines that could keep them alive. And what happened was that the politicians in favor of it brought a few people who had end-stage renal disease onto the House floor. And people were able to watch as they slowly turned from very, very sick and got dialysis and got better. And so as a result, they said they made a political commitment to basically find a way to cover. And the way that they covered them was through Medicare. I guess the old saying, uh, you don't want to see how laws and sausages are made, right? So let's let's talk a bit, little bit more about Medicare. There are different parts to Medicare, right? A, B, C, and D, sort of. Yes. Uh, so Medicare Part A is hospital coverage. Uh, Medicare Part D is the physician coverage, the coverage that you get for your outpatient visits. Medicare Part C is if you could opt out, you can get a private health plan. And it will cover a whole bunch of benefits, uh, usually more expensive than Part A and uh, Part B combined. And then Part D is what came in under George W. Bush, which was prescription drug benefits. And you have to get a private plan. You can't just have government Part D. 
you have to get it through Humana or Health First or Blue Cross Blue Shield or one of the local health plans. Okay, so that is a bit of privatization of the government plan. So Part C and Part D are both privatization. And uh, for what uh, whatever your belief system is, they've were, been pretty successful. So an example of Medicare Part C is it first came out in the mid-90s, and it only had a couple of percentage points of the overall Medicare population. So people in Medicare had a choice. They could go with traditional Medicare or they could join a private plan. The HMOs that everybody talks about that they don't like, they could opt into buying from them. And what happened is, is that over time, they become more and more popular. And so they went from being just a couple of percentage points of the overall Medicare population to now the most recent data in 2017 is that it's 34%. So 34% of every, every person in Medicare has a Medicare Part C plan, which basically means that they have a health insurance card through a private plan. Interesting. So that even the idea that Medicare, people are concerned that Medicare is um, inserting the government into places they don't want it because they they want uh, private industry to have a role due to the inefficiencies of the government. Uh, This doesn't really disprove that, but it shows that there is a role for both. There is a role for uh, government and private industry to work together to provide health care. Yeah, this is one of the areas where it's actually been pretty successful, in my opinion, because you have two thirds of the population that says, you know what, we want traditional Medicare. We want the government to pay for everything. We want our claims paid on time by the federal government. And they tend to be pretty happy with their health plans. Then you have a third of the population and it's been a growing share. In 2002, the share was 13 or 14 percent. And now it's 34 percent. That's pretty rapid growth. And what you see is that people are opting year after year to have these Medicare Advantage plans, uh, these private plans. And so what we see is they're sort of working side by side pretty well together. So I think when Medicare for All is being sold to the public, either from the right or the left, it's being sold as this you know giant socialist system. But I think we need to keep in mind where, where everybody's going to be covered and everybody's going to have great care if you're the left or government overreach if you're the right. But I think it's important to also discuss what it doesn't do. So what doesn't Medicare cover? So the big thing that Medicare does not cover is long-term care. So the vast majority of long-term care, meaning nursing home care, meaning home health aids, is paid for by Medicaid. So Medicare covers, I think, 60 days, and then you can get an additional 60 days at a higher rate. But basically, if you have to live in a nursing home, Medicare is not for a year, two years, five years. Medicare is not the thing that's paying for you. So that is the big gap, I would say, in Medicare coverage. The other thing that Medicare has in it is an enormous amount of what I would call cost sharing. What cost sharing is, is the amount that you actually have to pay the doctor or the hospital. So Medicare, by statute, pays for 80% of your bill. That means 20% is left to you. Well, lots of people, first of all, most of the people that are on Medicare are not working, like most, the vast majority, because they're retired or they have disability. And they may need expensive procedures. So an expensive procedure might be a hip replacement. A hip replacement might reasonably cost $50,000. 80% of $50,000 is $40,000, leaving the patient with $10,000 $10,000 bill, right? That's an enormous amount of money. So cost sharing is an incredibly important piece and it is not completely covered under Medicare. Right. That's another place where private industry has a role because you can buy supplemental insurance to cover the other 20%, correct? Absolutely. Uh, and that is because uh, there weren't enough letters in Medicare. Many people call that Medicare Part E. Okay. Uh, There are also a few other things that Medicare doesn't cover, right? I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and we see a lot of older people with hearing loss. Medicare doesn't cover hearing aids. Medicare doesn't cover dental. Like, there are plenty of other other parts of Medicare that leave holes open for uh, for private industry to to fill if Medicare for all is really Medicare for all. So that brings us to the next next question. What does Medicare for all even mean? Uh, We talked before the to show that there is there's a house bill on the is it on the floor right now what's what's going on with this medicare for all bill it's just sort of hanging there but there've been hearings about it which is sort of remarkable so this house bill it's now called HR 1384 the medicare for all act of 2019 
was introduced on February 27, 2019, by Representative Pramila Jayapal, Democrat of Washington. And this bill has been kicking around in its current form for close to 20 years. It gets introduced every couple of years as sort of uh, uh, like a message amendment, like a, a message that this is something that we support. The difference is, is that this year it has 108 co-sponsors, 108. Now, there are only 435 people in the House of Representatives. That means that, and about 50% of them are Republican, about 50% of them are Democrats. What that means is that about half of all of the Democrats in the House, or maybe a little bit less than half, are supporting Medicare for all. That is a big deal. And it specifically co-sponsoring, not just supporting this bill, but co-sponsoring it. And this bill is not just traditional Medicare for all. It has a bunch of changes to it, uh, to traditional Medicare, that make it even more, I would say, progressive. And also, in my opinion, make it somewhat unworkable and probably unpassable. So a couple of those things are that, number one, I mentioned that there's cost sharing as a problem, meaning that 80 people have to pay 20% of their overall health care bill as a result of uh, Medicare. And that's always how Medicare has been. It's been a successful program. This program says you pay 0%. Let's, let's talk about that for a second, because you are a health economist. So what are the cost implications of not having cost sharing? Right. So, I mean, this is standard demand, which is that as price goes down, the quantity that you want to buy goes up. And that may not hold true for something like brain surgery. You may, right, regardless of the cost of brain surgery, you're probably only getting the, the same amount, whether it costs you $1,000 or $0 or $10,000. But things like dental work, physical therapy, there's lots of other things where there is a somewhat elastic demand. So you're going to want, people are going to want to buy more if it becomes basically free to them. Even things like surgery, right? Like there are plenty of elective surgeries. I, as an otolaryngologist, right, one of the more common surgeries that I do on adults are is a septoplasty, right? The function of a septoplasty is to help you breathe better through your nose. So you can live a long, healthy, healthy life with a pretty stuffy nose. So it's really more of a, it's a quality of life issue, right? I mean, there are certain health problems that would be improved by breathing better through your nose, but the, the majority of these surgeries are really just to improve your quality of life, life, right? It's a lot more comfortable. You can get a better night's sleep if you're breathing through your nose. Okay, but how much is that worth to someone? If they have no out-of-pocket expense, they're going to have a much lower threshold to follow through with that surgery than if they had some out-of-pocket expense. Now, suddenly, if they're going to have to shell out $1,000 or like, let's say, 0.25% of their gross annual income just to make up a number, right? They might, some people might say, oh, I'm absolutely miserable. This is totally worth it. And some people might say, you know what? It's really not that bad. So I think the demand for even something like, yeah, fine, not brain surgery, but there are plenty of like electric orthopedic surgeries, a knee replacement, a hip replacement. These are big deal surgeries, but a lot of them are contingent on the amount of discomfort the patient is in. And that might vary the amount of surgery that ends up being done. So increasing the cost in total. You're, you're giving me a look. The look is now you sound like me and I'm so happy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So the, basically, we believe, economists believe that most things, as you reduce the price of them, people are going to want to buy more. And that's obviously very clear when it comes to cars and televisions and food. But it is also true to a lesser extent, but to a very tangible extent in healthcare. And it varies by the type of service that you're getting, right? Nobody, right, you, for some surgeries, there may be some elasticity of demand. For others, it may be much lower. But yes, the demand for care as a result of reducing cost sharing from 20% to zero is definitely going to go up. So now we're, we're increasing access to care, but we're also increasing the cost of care. And I think one of the reasons that Medicare for All is gaining popularity is because people are seeing how much their care costs, right? They want a government option because they, they want an option where they're not necessarily paying out of pocket directly. I mean, it's, it's all paid for by the, the people because even if it's paid for the tax dollars, it's paid for ultimately by the people. So, you know, they want less out of pocket expense 
but ultimately what you're doing is you're you're just spreading out that out of pocket expense but then the cost goes up sure i mean i think what you're saying is that the premium would go up right as right the healthcare premium is the amount that you pay every month to your health insurance company to cover your insurance and that would go up if you reduce cost sharing to zero so that is definitely true this case is a little bit more complicated than that. And the reason is, is that there wouldn't be any premiums anymore, right? Because Medicare would be covering all of healthcare for everybody. And so therefore, it would somehow be done through the tax system. Which is, you're just calling it a different name. You're calling it a premium, but now you're calling it a tax. It is effectively the cost of healthcare. Yes. So yes and no. Right. So, yes, I'm changing the name from a premium to the cost of health care. And so if I'm an average American. Right. And this is only true for the one single person that is the absolute average in the middle um, that they would take their premiums. Right. Which are, let's say, ten thousand dollars a year and substitute that for a tax, which is ten thousand dollars a year. And then they it all comes out in the wash and it doesn't really matter to them. However, in reality, all the people on the lower part of the income scale, right, would were paying $10,000 a year in premium, but they would be paying a lower tax because taxes are progressive based on their income. All the wealthier people would be paying a much higher tax. They would be basically because you're paying this now Medicare tax, whatever is going to subsidize Medicare, as a percentage of their overall earnings. And so it would be so some people would be better off and some people would be worse off as a result of this. Think about it in terms of, the way that I think about it in terms of is property tax versus which funds private, which funds public schools. So you pay property tax, you have a bigger house, you pay more to your education. You have a smaller house, you pay less to your education, right? However, if you go to private school, all that matters is whether you go to private school, then you pay a tuition for one, and if you don't go, to, right, and you pay basically per kid, the, it's regardless of the size of your house or the size of your income, you pay the exact same amount. So you're going from a system like a private school tuition where you're paying per person uh, to a public school tuition where you're essentially paying as a part of your property taxes. Well, how do, how do other countries deal with that, right? I had an, an episode earlier where I spoke to a general practitioner in the UK system, and it sounds like the way that these places do it is they decrease access to care. So, right, so in order to prevent so many people from getting the the knee replacement that they want now, there's a long wait. So they just don't make it available. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that would happen, right? So so the way that the UK does it is, is through general taxes, and this is the way that most com- countries do it. Germany is a little bit different. They have employer-specific requirements where the employers are essentially required to pay premiums. But a lot of countries like Canada and the UK, they do it through general taxation for Medicare, uh, medical care. But so the medical, so basically what you have happening in the Medicare for all proposed legislation, the HR 1384, is that you're going to increase demand because you're reducing cost sharing to zero. The other thing that you have happening is that Medicare is going there. You're eliminating all of the health insurance companies. And so I said that Medicare currently has this nice, I don't know if symbiosis is the right word, but this nice cooperation between the government run Medicare plans, uh, the government run Medicare and the private health plans, which also compete in this space, and you've got two-thirds going to one and a third going to the other. Medicare for All says, nope, insurance companies, we don't like them, they're out the window. What that means is 100% of people would be have government insurance. One thing that Medicare does is it sets your price. You don't get to negotiate with Medicare and tell them how much you want to be paid for your services. They tell you how much you're going to be paid. And because 100% of the population would be covered by this, you would basically just have to take that price. You wouldn't be able to do anything about it. That is the price that you would have to take. And one thing that we know about governments is they don't pay as much as the private sector. So basically what you would be doing is you would be reducing the overall price that people would be paying. And we know also from economics that when you reduce the overall price, the number of practitioners goes down. You'd say, you know what, if I'm just getting this amount, I used to be getting paid this amount, now I'm getting paid this amount, 
I'm going to spend a little more time with my kids because it's not worth it for me to work. I'm going to you know, cut out a few Saturdays. So we're going to see the supply of services go down. So what we're going to see, theoretically, is that the demand for services goes up and then the supply for services goes down. And we have a name for this. The name for that is a shortage, right? When you have supply that is less than what demand is, then you have a shortage of services. And that is exactly what we see in the UK, right? That's where the lines come from. When there's a shortage of something, right, then you see a big, long line for it. And so that's where the English have their cues. So what are, what are, what are we talking about in terms of the cost of this system? Have there been any proposals made or estimates made like by the uh, Congressional Budget Office about how much this system would cost given given the way the proposal is structured? There have been a couple, uh, none by the CBO. CBO basically, I think, I don't know if they were asked to score it, but what they did was they came out with a very nice academic paper about comparing healthcare costs in the U.S. to other countries. That nobody scored, no, there, there's no number I can give you that is the amount. There are four or five scores that are out there from a couple of different organizations. They vary incredibly wildly. And when I say incredibly wildly, um, the, the big joke in Washington used to be a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking real money. With healthcare, over 10 years, you're talking about variations of trillions of dollars. So I'm not going to say what any of those, I don't think if I tell you it's 1 trillion versus 5 trillion versus 10 trillion, which is what a couple of the estimates are, I don't think that helps anybody, you know, understand what this is. But it's an enormous, healthcare spending is $3.5 trillion in the U.S. in, in I think, 2017. Well, we had an evolutionary biologist on the show a couple of episodes ago, and really evolutionarily, human beings are able to conceptualize zero, one, two and many. So once you get beyond that, um, we just, the concept of like 3 trillion versus 10 trillion doesn't necessarily mean much, but, but in terms of like, how much would my taxes go up? Right. Like, but I think what we were talking about before the show is that that really hasn't gotten, we haven't really gotten that far in terms of like, where would the money even come from? Yeah, I mean, I think we should shift to talking politically about how realistic this is, because to me, this is a message amendment, right? Which is that you've got a system uh, in Medicare and Medicaid, actually, where you've got health plans that are working pretty well to get people care that they want, and the, the subscribers are, for the most part, pretty happy with them. And if they weren't, they wouldn't opt out. They would not choose to be in them. And so you've got this this uh, legislation that's saying, oh, cost sharing goes down to zero and everything's out and we're not going to tell and all health insurance is out and we're not going to tell you how we're going to pay for it. What that tells me is that this is really a message bill. It's uh, to, to say that we support universal coverage, but not necessarily under these conditions. And there's a very narrow path for this uh, certainly in this form, but even in any form to to move forward, right? Because like, how would this move forward? Right now, politically, you've got a Republican president who does not support this, a Republican Senate who does not support this, and a Democratic House for whom some of the people support it, but the more moderate Democrats do not support it. So obviously nothing's going to happen before January of 2021, right? It's inconceivable anything could happen before then. After January 21, there's a couple of co- potential realistic options, Right. The first one is is that Trump remains president, right? Trump wins the second term in office and nothing happens in terms of health care, right? That that would be one very reasonable possible scenario. A second is that you have a centrist Democrat, like the PAC leader right now, Joe Biden, comes in. Joe Biden lived with the Affordable Care Act for 10 years. He watched this relatively minor incremental change bill become law, and he watched his you know, White House, the White House that Obama, Obama's White House and that he worked for, basically lose all of his political capital and lose the House in 2010 as a direct result of the Affordable Care Act passing. I think it's worth just taking a second to explore. We have a previous episode on m- misconceptions of the Affordable Care Act. It was uh, one of the first episodes. So I think it would be worth, if you're enjoying this episode, check out episode three of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. With me. What? With, <laughs> with Adam Block. So- what that did was it expanded the amount, the number of people that covered were covered under Medicaid. It uh, gave a requirement for the number of 
uh, the size that your company would need to be in order to, you would have to insure your employees. And then it, it provided small business owners and individuals with an exchange for an opportunity for them to uh, buy healthcare. So it just, it tried to close the gap from the people that weren't covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or by their employers. And that caused the blue wave that was the Obama administration to lose almost all political capital. And it was hard enough for the Democrats to agree on the nuances of the Affordable Care Act. So that was just closing a gap. Now we're talking about taking the healthcare industry, which is what, a quarter of the GDP? So I think it's 17%. 17% of the GDP and blowing it up completely. So you're taking something that's trying to close the gap, destroyed the, the political party for a decade, and now you're trying to do the same thing to the 10th degree. Yeah. So Joe Biden's not having it. Yeah. So this this he's not going to say as much. This this doesn't seem like I mean, Bernie Sanders is going to say it because that's his M.O. But like, realistically, this this Medicare for all not going to happen. But I think we we should explore. First, I want to get back to the House bill because we drifted away from that. So I want to talk more about what the House bill means. The, and then I, I want to talk about are there any aspects of this that you think are realistic. So, so, well, there is a reasonable pathway where this could become on the agenda, right? Because healthcare is becoming more and more central to people's agenda. You see, even the Trump administration has said pharmaceutical costs are too high, and they have made that a, uh, I don't want to say a central part of what they do, but it is from a HHS perspective, from a health and human services perspective, that is the big White House agenda item. So, and what I have seen in the sort of almost 20 years I've been working in this field, is that healthcare has moved from agenda, uh, political agenda item number three to number two, and now it is very close to number one. Healthcare was clearly a reason that the Democrats took back the House in 20, uh, 2018. So, so there, there is a narrow path where this could come up, in which case uh, you have a left, a very left wing Democrat winning the nomination on health care agenda. And the Democrats would, against the odds, also have to win the Senate. And they would also have to override the filibuster so that they could pass a major legislation. And they would have to make this their top priority agenda. So there is a path. It is an extraordinarily narrow one, and I don't expect it to happen. But, you know, there there is a path. So so for those that are, like, very worried about this, I don't think this is something that you need to be very worried about. That said, any of the physicians should probably be very worried about it because, like, government pricing means that you will all make less, like, and not a little bit less, like a decent amount less. And the AMA and the, all the hospital associations have come out, you know, relatively strongly opposed to this, or they have very mixed feelings about it because they sort of smell that that is exactly what would happen. I think everyone's, uh, oh, not everyone, a lot of physicians are, including myself, are for some form of universal coverage. But you'll be hard pressed to find someone that says, I'm for universal coverage and making a lot less money, right? <laughs> but let's go back to that, that House bill. So the House bill says uh, Medicare for all, but not Medicare not covering everything, um, um, 80% Medicare covering 100%. What other aspects are this to this House, house bill? It's not that long. Oh, <laughs> that, that's... That's it. Okay. There's no pay fors in it. Uh, so right. So how is this going to be funded? They don't. It, it doesn't say so in the bill. Yeah. And so if it's going to pass, right? CBO has to score it, and then they have to basically it has to be budget neutral in some way. But this bill is not going to pass. So right. So or as it is, without adding that stuff to it, so they don't have to include it in there. And you never like to include how people are going to pay for it because nobody likes to pay for stuff. We just like to give healthcare to everybody for free. We just like to get stuff, right? Which is the whole idea behind why Affordable Care Act costs so much political capital. But once it's there, the Republicans having the presidency and the House and the Senate were unable to repeal it, right? Because once, once you have an entitlement, 
You can't take it away. Uh, you can, but you will lose badly for a very long time. Uh, if the Republicans had been successful in overturning the ACA, I think that the wave would have been even stronger because there are a lot of people that don't even know that they have um, ACA funded health care that would have lost health care as a result of it. And they would have come out in droves and, and voted and changed their votes. Yes. So I agree with you. When you have an entitlement, they generally tend to be relatively sticky. So are there any other universal coverage proposals out there floating around? So I haven't studied uh, any out there. I mean, the the thing that you could see happening is that um, there is an appetite for universal coverage and you have some liberal states out there who have uh, some flexibility with how to spend their Medicaid dollars. And they may try to pass universal coverage within their own state. I have heard about this in Vermont. That was like 10 years ago. It hasn't gone anywhere. I've heard about this in Oregon and Washington, Massachusetts. And it's particularly appealing to do it in these states. So for example, Massachusetts has an uninsured rate of something like 4%. So well, if you're only trying to cover an additional 4% of people, it's not that expensive. If you've got Texas, which has a 15%, you're covering 15% of the population. It's way more expensive to cover 15% of your population than it is to cover 4%. So you may see some things happening with the state, especially with a lack of action at the federal level, whether or not there's a Republican administration or a Democrat administration starting in 2020. The case that I've always thought was interesting is now in New York, because in New York, you have a couple of stars aligning. Now, New York, in my view, uh, is too big and too diverse to be the first state to pass something as, you know, really revolutionary in the United States as universal health care. However, there are a couple of stars that have aligned in New York. And those stars are that in New York, the Democrats took over both the Senate and the House for the first time in 25 or 30 years. So they have Democratic majorities in both. The governor is Andrew Cuomo, who is a third term governor who uh, won an overwhelming election in 2018 and is not currently running for president in 2020, but may have an eye in 2024 when all the dust settles. So you could see a pathway where New York says, you know what I'm going to do? We're going to pass universal health care here in New York State. And I, Andrew Cuomo, and an effective uh, executive, and I'm going to get this up and running and it is going to work. And I'm going to run on that in 2024. So whereas two years ago, three years ago, I would have said never going to happen. I now think that never going to happen in New York, make you know changes to some small probability, but very realistic probability because the stars are, are currently aligned. That said, I'm not hearing too much of a buzz about it. I also read somewhere that, that Medicare as a brand could be offered as a product on the exchange. And I think that's just, it, it, it's an interesting because people, people love their Medicare, yeah. have it, tend to love it. And so then using it, you know, like private industry would, using it as a brand, not necessarily, you know, it might not even be Medicare, for what it is, but Medi- Medicare as the brand. So, uh, just I think in, in wrapping things up, uh, are there any? Is there is there any other buzz out there? I'd just be interested in hearing your take on as as a health economist on, you know, wh- what you know, at the state level I think is, is a great example. That's realistic at a federal level, unrealistic. But you know, f- as far as regarding universal coverage, I think this is opening up a bit a bit of Pandora's box. But feel free to speak on this for as long as you want, the, the, the advantages, disadvantages, and pitfalls of some type of universal coverage system. And we already talked about the supply versus the demand, but you know, are, there any, are there any other aspects of it that you think physicians in particular need to be informed about? I mean, I think when there are, right, when, when there is government pricing, prices are lower than what they are when there is not government pricing. So that is something that physicians should sort of recognize. And uh, in terms of the Medicare as a brand, I mean, what you're talking about is basically the public option that got, you know, was pretty hot in the ACA and something I 
would have been thought would have been very interesting and would have probably improved some of the markets where you don't really have too much competition. So it's certainly possible that it co- could come out at the state level, that there could be some states that try to improve their exchange markets by offering some kind of public option. That's certainly a possibility. So some states out there possibly creating a universal coverage system, some states out there possibly just having a, a government option on the exchange as, as, a, as a way of dipping their toes into the water. I think giving us uh, a splash of water in the face as like a, a wake up of, of what is out there and, and what is possible and really what is not possible politically to, to accomplish, I think is, is really a lot of the theme of what was discussed today. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us and educate us about it. And uh, as things move along politically, I think, having you uh, on the show again to to talk about it as things evolve would be great. I'm always happy to do it. And uh, mom and dad love me best. You've uh, proven that uh, yet again, because you live five minutes from them and I live a laborious half an hour from them, which was an ungodly thing to do. And I'm still being guilted and punished for it. So this was a test to see if they're listening to my podcast, which I'm sure they're not proving yet again. They love you more. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.